Novak Djokovic lost in the third round of the U.S. Open just 24 hours after Carlos Alcaraz was bounced from the tournament. Who could have predicted that? Given my winner's picks, I'll have Goff, Shelton, Popperin. Yes, I know. That's insane. Y'all, Djokovic fans, y'all go ahead and roast me for it. I don't even give a... I don't care. Roast me. I know it's crazy to say this, but I believe Popperin will win. That's why they pay me the big bucks. That's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> hey, my name is Christian Bassnight, and welcome to Christian's Court, where I cover tennis from all angles. If you haven't yet already, make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever I post more bomb predictions like that. Anyways, defending champion Novak Djokovic finishes a calendar year without a slam for the first time since 2017 after Alexei Popperin eliminated him from the U.S. Open by a score of 6-4, 6-4, 4 in the third round. This is the first time that Popperin has defeated a top five player at a major, and it will be his first slam second week appearance. As I mentioned in the intro, I caught this result. I had Popperin getting the W in my last video and getting into right exactly into how exactly he pulled it off. Djokovic, he actually started the match very well, and he had a 3-2 love 40 lead with five chances to break first in that sixth game the first opportunity was novak's best chance and the pair there they engaged in a long lengthy rally which novak ended with a netted, netted drop shot those last four chances novak did not get a single return back in the court due to solid serving from popperin that 2-3 game was one of the most influential in this entire match as it gave popperin a lot of confidence and helped him settle into this match a lot more it wasn't quite a a boomerang break, but Popperin used the momentum from that clutch 2-3 hold, and he broke Djokovic at love, catching the serve off guard with some excellent returning. He played a solid service game then after to seal the opener at love too. Djokovic's serve was under a lot of scrutiny after this match, and yes, it was not a good serving day at all from Novak, which I'll talk more about later, but I think his return was also pretty poor and deserves some of the blame as well. Pa sometimes Popperin served in relatively, you know, routine, weaker even, second serves, and Novak missed them badly. It was really shocking. Popperin got the lone necessary break in the second set at 2 all, and he was aided from Novak not making many first serves in play in that game. Popperin is crazy good from the ground as well, so Novak not being able to get free and easy points from his serve definitely hurt him. At one point, I thought that the match, though, was 100% Novak's because at 5-3 in the second set, the Aussie appeared seriously hurt, and he was grabbing at his ankle or his Achilles, and I thought that he would definitely pull the plug, but he calmed everyone's nerves down the following game when he easily served out the set at 15. Popperin's level definitely it dropped a little bit in the third set and Novak took advantage. He came out on top of more of those baseline exchanges and he also improved his serving winning 64% of his second serve points and then he also won 73% of points whenever he got a second serve look from the Aussie so he was returning better as well. The fourth set was definitely defined by Alexi's clutchness and Novak's inability to step up and take his chance. Novak had two break chances in Popperin's opening service game in the fourth set, but he could not take advantage of his second serve looks that he got. Djokovic also had a 30 love opening in the following service game of Popperin's, but his relentless fight definitely helped him save off that one. And then two, that fight was on full display in the iconic two all game of the fourth set. When on his fourth break point, Alexi had hit the biggest I'm him moment when he blasted this huge forehand and held the pose in the extended grunt. It was cold, y'all. Djokovic had two break back points at 3-2, but Popperin was simply too good hitting a clutch forehand pass followed by an ace. The 4-2 game from Popperin to go up the double break was even crazier. He showed his exceptional athleticism hitting some insane passing shots that left even Djokovic dumbfounded. However, Popperin was aided by two Djokovic double faults when the serve had game points, which was bizarre for sure. Popperin getting that insurance double break was mad crucial because the nerves got to him when he tried to serve this match out the first time at 5-2, but he did not blink a bit on his second attempt serving out the match at love at 5-4. When speaking about this loss in the press, Djokovic said, honestly, with the way I felt and played from the start of the tournament, round three is a success. I play some of the worst tennis I've ever played, serving by far some of the worst ever. On a quick surface like this, you can't win without a serve. You can't win against the guys who are in form like Alexi. It was just an awful match for me. This statistically was Novak's worst serving day, at least in a slam. He served 14 
14 double faults, which is the most that he served in a major ever in his career. I've said this in my past few videos where Djokovic has lost in slams, but I can't help but wonder yet again, has Novak slam reign come to an end? Will he ever win another slam again? This is also the first year too since 2001, since the big three has not taken home a major, since at least one of the members of the big three hasn't won a major. You know, father time is undefeated. Novak is 37 years old and has dealt with a lot more injuries recently in the latter part of his career. And I think that best of five will only become a factor against him too, as he continues to get older in age. Not to mention yet again, with the new crop of players with the talented center in Alcaraz, I think it'll be very tough. Now, Djokovic, he did take down Alcaraz in the Olympics final. However, that was best of three, and Novak dang near needed to sell his soul in order to get that win with how well he played to get that gold medal. I think that he definitely has one more in him, but I do not see him winning many more. You know, he talks about oh, wanting to play four more years at least, playing well into his 40s, but I don't know if I see that, to be honest. Novak now drops down to number four in the last rankings and he low-key might exit the top 10 if he does not have a good indoor swing as he is defending ATP finals champion points. I will be interested to see how he ends the year. You know, Novak already typically plays lighter schedules and two with this being an Olympic year I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't play at all until Paris or even if he skipped Paris and just went straight into the ATP finals or maybe what if he just shut it down completely this year like Serena used to do focusing on our victor huge credit to Alexei Popperin for getting the biggest win of his life I knew Popperin had the game of course once again I predicted this result but you know I knew he could challenge Novak because he challenged him in their previous matches. Again, he played Novak at the third round of both the Australian Open and Wimbledon this year. And I knew that the difference maker here would be Alexi having the confidence from winning the biggest title of his life earlier this month, I believe, in Montreal, which, which was a 1,000 tournament there. He showcased excellent tennis there. So I think that definitely that confidence helped him get over the finish line for sure here. Now, waiting popper in the round of 16 is Francis Tiafo, who prevailed in a blockbuster third round battle of the Young Americans. Tiafo outlasted Ben Schultzen in the match of the tournament thus far, in my opinion, with a final score of 4-6, 7-5, 5-7, 6-4, 6-3. successfully avenged his four set loss to Shelton from last year's open quarterfinal. Shelton looked like he'd improve his head to head to 3 0 against Big Foe early on as he looked like the clear better player for the first part of this match. His serve was a much bigger weapon out there and he had far more firepower from the ground than Tiafo and he was in clear control of many of the baseline exchanges. The two exchanged a few breaks in the opening set but Shelton stepped up his returning right when he needed to in that ninth in that 10th game I mean to take the opener. Francis did do a better job of protecting his serve in the second set and he elevated his returning as well which made him the definite better player in set number two. Tiafo had eight break looks but he could not convert on any of his first break eight break points in the second set. I gotta give him credit though for staying the course and not getting down on himself too much because meta players would have been pissed and faded away but not Big Foe. He was determined. He hung around and finally took the second set on his ninth break opportunity. The third set was tight and both guys had looks early on in each of each other's service games to break but it was Shelton who broke first at 15 to put himself in position to serve out the set at 5-3. Despite holding set point at in that 5-3 game, Shelton could not serve it out and we were brought to a tiebreaker where things got weird. Shelton won the first six points of the breaker and then Tiafo reeled off the next five before Shelton closed it out with an ace. One point separated these two after the first three sets. Now once again, Francis could have easily faded away after losing the set in that manner, but he would not be denied. The major turning point in the match to me was in the opening game of the fourth set when Ben had a love 30 look on Francis to serve. He came in and approached well, but Tiafo hit this insane cross-court forehand passing shot on the run to avoid the love for the deficit before holding Seraph at 30. From that point on, Francis was the better player of the match, and he had quite a few looks in the fourth set to break, but Shelton staved them off. However, the 21-year-old could not erase Tiafo's fifth break point look of the fourth set, which of course came on set point to bring us to a 
decider. The final dagger in Shelton's chest was when he failed to capitalize on two break points at one all. Francis got the boomerang break to go up 3-1 and he never looked back. It also helped that Francis was the fitter of the two guys in the end. Shelton started to get a little bit gas and his ankle clearly was bothering him. He started to grab at the ankle. Giving Francis his credit and his due praise, this is a massive win from Tiafo. Perhaps one of the biggest wins of his career. I've been so impressed with him this entire summer hardcourt swing. The early part of the season was not good at all from Francis. And really crazy enough, him making that clown comment at Wimbledon turned his entire season around. You know, he had that excellent run at Wimbledon, barely losing, almost losing, beating Carlos Alcaraz, the eventual champion in round three. Then in DC, he made the semifinals, getting a good win over Rublev from the process. And of course, he made the Cincinnati Open Finals playing clutch incredible tennis en route to his maiden masters 1000 final and then here too against ben there were so many opportunities to where francis could have gone away i've mentioned that throughout this video but he hung tough despite ben outplaying him at out times he was the steadier of the two in addition to francis's exceptional rally tolerance he was also awesome at net he won 73 percent of points in the four court and he came into net 48 times, which I think made the difference. Speaking of the net, their embrace, these two at the net, their embrace was so nice and just so heartwarming to see. You know, these guys are good friends off the court, so it was nice to see them being able to hug it out still after such an intense four hour battle. Not just the embrace at the net, too, but Eubanks interviewing Francis. It was beautiful, y'all. It was a movie out there. Like many people said, this match deserved a primetime slot, and it's a true shame that they had to meet so early because this match was definitely worthy of another slam quarterfinal for sure. Now, how far can Francis go in this tournament? You know, of course, with Djokovic out, it improves his chances, and he clearly loves playing here at this tournament, his home slam. He's reached the fourth round at the Open now for four years running. Popperin in the next round would not be a pushover by any means. He's been playing excellent this summer himself, but with how well Francis has been playing and with the crowd being fully behind him, I think that is, of course, very doable. Now, looking elsewhere in this now wide open bottom half of the men's draw, Casper Root got his second career win from two sets to love down, beating 19-year-old Chinese lefty Jerry Shang, 6-7, 3-6, 6-love, 6, seven, three, set, three, six, six, love, six, three, six one. Rude won the last 18 of 22 games and was stronger physically in the end. Shang definitely weathered away, and it's understandable with him being so young and not being accustomed to playing all this tennis, but he'll get that second slam, or get that slam second week soon. Casper now sets up a mouth-watering round of 16 affair with 12th seed Taylor Fritz, who dispatched of Francisco Comenciana, 6-3, 6-4, 6-2. Fritz, who has yet to drop a set this tournament, matches Andre Agassi and become the first American man since Agassi in 2003 to reach the second week at all four majors in the same season. Rude does lead the head-to-head -head with Taylor 2 to nothing, but Fritz is my clear pick in this match, and I say that because not only will he have the crowd behind him, but he's also been in better form this tournament and will have more in the tank coming into this match, getting through his matches so routinely, so I'm having him take this one in four sets. Brandon Nakashima joins his fellow American Taylor in the round of 16 as the San Diego native notched his second top 20 win of the tournament alone, beating 18th seed Lorenzo Musetti, 6-2, 3-6, 6-3, 7-6. This result itself wasn't that surprising with how well Nakashima has been playing all summer, getting wins over Fritz, Paul, and then in the lead up tournaments. But what surprised me with Nakashima is how he clawed his way back from being love for down in the fourth set and overcoming two break deficits before ultimately taking it in four. Normally, Brandon is more reserved and to himself, but tonight he was lit and he engaged a lot more with the crowd, which I think helped him get over the finish line. Nakashima will be playing just his second slam round of 16 match when he takes on fourth seed Alexander Zverev, who etched past Thomas Van Etchvery. 5775-6163. Nakashima will be the notable underdog, but I think that he has an excellent shot at making his maiden major quarterfinal. He took a set over Zverev when they played here at the US Open four years ago, and that's the same year where Alex finished runner-up. These fourth round matchups are insane, y'all, because we also have six-seeded Andre Rublev taking on number nine, Grigor Dimitrov. Rublev had a clean 6-3, 7-5, 6-4 win over Yuri Lehechka, who was clearly gassed after his long five-setter in the round prior. Dimitrov has remained untested in this tournament thus far, not dropping more than nine games in any of his three matches, as he crushed Talon Greekspor 3-3-1 on Friday. 
Andre leads the head-to-head -head with Grigor 4-3, but I might favor the Bulgarian because of how well he has been playing in this tournament. The big question now is, who has the best shot at making the finals now that the four-time champion Djokovic is out? Obviously, there's a big chance that there's going to be an American with three American guys seeking to become the first U.S. man to make a slam singles final since Andy Roddick made the 2009 Women in Championship match. Nakashima, to me, has the least favorable shot as he faces Zverev next, who is the highest ranked um, player remaining in the draw. I could see Fritz Tiafo semifinal for sure. Dimitrov, as I mentioned, is playing very well. And Rublev, I don't know if he has the greatest shot with him having that um, ugly losing record and major quarterfinals he's never won a major slam quarterfinal in his career so that's going to be tough for him to overcome for sure i think zverev has the most experience and he on paper will be the favorite but still i think it's very tough to call i don't even know yet for sure who i think will make it i guess i did pick zverev in my tournament preview to make the final i don't want him to make i don't want him to make it um I might go with Fritz, but that's not my final pick. Maybe Fritz. I don't know. Anyways, going over the men's matches on tap for day six, we have Yannick Center and Chris O'Connell starting us off on Ash in the day. And then during the night, Flavio Caboli looks to upset 2021 champion Daniil Medvedev. Gabriel Diallo and Tommy Paul take Louis Armstrong on the day. And then in the night session, there's Alex e. Menor going up against Dan Evans. Akira Slayer, Botic van de Zanschlup, takes on 2050 Jack Draper on grandstand and then Matteo Arnaldi takes on the Aussie Jordan Thompson and then on stadium 17 the veteran from Belgium David Goffin will play Czech Thomas Mahach and finally Nuno Borges takes on Jakob Menzik. My picks here to come through are Sinner, Medvedev, Paul, Evans, Arnaldi, Mahach, and Borges. Were you shocked by this Novak loss or like me, did you see it coming? Also, who do you think will come through and make the finals here in this bottom half? Again, make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell so you're notified whenever I post more US Open updates like this. Thank you all so much for watching and for your support and I'll see y'all next time here on Christian's Court.